welcome back to Prolong Your Days with Dr. Christy Anderson. You know, we've been talking about emotions and we've been looking at having skills and developing skills to direct um, our emotions because emotions are like water. They have to be directed. And we started with anger, right? Anger was that external boundary, that sentry, that guard that stands in case someone crosses over your boundary and it helps you maintain separateness and distinction, knowing where you begin and end and where another person begins and end, ends. And then we worked on its uh, partner, fear, right? And that fear was that uh, fear of the Lord. It gives us our focus. It connects us um, and allows for intimacy and connection with our intuition and our instincts. And so fear working hand in hand with anger uh, allowed us to have boundaries, but then have intimacy and be sensitive uh, to that and focused. So working hand in hand with these, another aspect of anger is the internal guard, which is shame. Now, nobody likes to look at shame. Shame is something that we, none of us like to feel, but if we get skills, we can actually guide and direct those waves of shame that come when they come, when we fall short or we do something wrong. And it helps us have that internal self control. And so if we can connect with healthy, free flowing shame and reconnect with that, because many of us, unfortunately are not taught how to handle shame appropriately and how to function the way it was designed, the way God designed it to be to cause repentance and to help us guard our tongue and to help us bring honor to ourselves and others in the Lord. And unfortunately, without healthy free flowing shame and without a good connection to that, it's impossible to give honor. It's impossible to do that. You have to connect with that to have that internal guard. So we will look at some keys and give you today some keys that are going to allow you to recognize the distinction, which is going to be central. You've got to know and make distinction between healthy, free flowing shame and the weaponized shame that unfortunately our culture, especially, you know, through the internet and, you know, 24, 24 or seven news cycle, and all of that, people tend today to have really weaponized shame. And shame is supposed to be an internal guard, not something that we use to control other people or manipulate or uh, try to control their behavior, right? By shaming them or public shaming and all these things. Um, these are different elements of a weaponized type shame. And unfortunately, most of us have been introduced to shame early on, not in a healthy way, but by experiencing a weaponized version of shame. So to start, let's first make some distinctions between guilt and shame. And I'm going to make a very specific distinction between those two terms because on the one hand, guilt is just, uh, it's not an emotion. Um, now we, we use it as an English term to sometimes mean an emotion, but if I'm going to be very clear in making distinction between guilt and shame, um, and then shame of course has different nuances under it. It's more of like an umbrella term. You could be embarrassed or you could actually have some uh, other element that's a little different within the idea of shame. So um, on the macro level, we're looking at guilt and shame. On the macro level, we're gonna say guilt is a uh, legal status, okay? So if you're guilty, you're either guilty or you're not guilty of doing something uh, wrong in terms of an objective standard. And the objective standard as Christians, we would go with God's law. You have uh, violated God's law, therefore all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Therefore, you're guilty of sin, you, you're guilty before God, and so that's just a fact. It's not an emotional state. You either are guilty or you're not guilty. It's like you're either pregnant or you're not pregnant, so that's guilt. So we're not, you know, occasionally we might slip into the use of I felt guilty. Um, uh, so that really is talking about shame, though. You're 
feeling shame because you recognized your guilt. Okay. Now, sometimes shame, uh, when we start getting into kind of the micro level now, the micro level of shame, there's going to be both a biblical kind of concept of shame, a violation of God's law. You recognize you sinned. You maybe you stole something. Maybe it was inadvertent. Uh, it doesn't matter. You're guilty of theft in that case, um, and therefore uh, you're going to have guilt and shame and it's going to rise up and, and, and it's valid. Okay. But then there's the weaponized shame and weaponized shame is, it has different nuances. It could be somebody else trying to control you by publicly shaming you. And it may be a valid shame, but it's still shame is to be the internal guard. It's not the external guard. That's anger. So shame is not supposed to be used as a weapon against other people. That's not giving people honor, um, but trying to control their behavior. Now, obviously there's times that we're going to uh, go to someone privately and why would that be important when they do something wrong or offend us? Well, because we want to protect their honor, right? So why do we not do Lashan Hara, which means the evil tongue? Why do we not gossip? Why do we not do those things? Because that would cause someone shame, right? Public shame. That's an inappropriate gossip is an inappropriate use of shame. Okay. So it's shame is your internal guard to help you have self-control. But if you're disconnected from a healthy shame, then you're not going to recognize that prompting of the Holy Spirit that's going to run out ahead of you. And when you're about to open your mouth to say something you shouldn't, and then give you that momentary jolt, that pause that goes, and you go, oh, and you get that little nudge. And sometimes it's subtle. And sometimes if it's more of a shocker, like you weren't expecting it, it might really stop you in your tracks. So it depends on the circumstances. But essentially, shame is going to run out ahead of you just to give you that momentary pause. Now, if you're dissociated, you have some kind of blockage, you're um, ignoring it, or you're, you're, you're afraid of it, or uh, you've seen it used so wrongly and weaponized against you so long that you just can't even connect with it anymore. Those are kind of signs of obstruction. And so you're going to need to reconnect because at the end of the day, one of the most important things we have to understand about shame is the distinction between the healthy shame and the not healthy shame. But how then do we work positively with shame? You know, that would be the first thing. Well, first you want to welcome it. Okay. So in order to, um, make distinction, you've got to first connect with healthy shame. So you've got to, when you feel shame come up and you have that pause and you pause, you ground yourself back in the moment. You, you don't dissociate, you don't check out, you don't ignore it. You feel it. And once you feel it and you kind of, you know, let that feeling percolate for just a second and don't be afraid of it. If you're not afraid of it and you know, if I, oh, if I just direct this, if I direct it in the right way, then I can, it'll go away really quick and contentment and, and joy will come back. Um, and, and honor can come back. Okay. So if you welcome it, uh, when you get that pull, it, it'll feel like a pull in your gut. Maybe, um, you'll get a flush of heat on your face. Perhaps, um, you might get momentary speechlessness. Um, if you just kind of get taken aback, we might describe it as, um, it's that sense of internal caution or a signal that just kind of that internal nudge of like, ah, yeah, what are you doing? You know, that internal in your spirit nudge. If you can reconnect with that, um, and then stop quickly what you're doing, take that moment, step back. Um, let the wave give you that momentary pause, ground yourself. As I said, in the moment, don't fly off. Don't dissociate. Don't distract yourself from the horrible feeling. Don't deflect it, own it, you know, if it's legit and we'll get into the distinction in a little while. Um, don't stuff it. Don't ignore it. Um, and let that shame wave come and because if you don't actually, the warning is it will lead to a rapids level shame in a feedback loop. And you don't want to go there because now it's weaponizing against yourself. You're going to own the shame and, and you're not going to deal with it. And then it's just going to sit there inside yourself and it's just going to hound you. And then the enemy can use it against you. And then that gets into a very unhealthy uh, blockage state. So the next thing you're going to want to do is intensify your boundary. And what, what do I mean by that? 
there's a sense in um, kind of Hebraic thought and you know understanding the temple and and the sacred space and sacred you know sacredness of space and so kind of your personal space um, think of your your personal space and your and then your home is another personal space and the different rooms in the different home in your home are personal and more private and more sacred kind of you only let certain people into certain spaces in your home right you you let people get close to you like in your foyer you might entertain in the front room you might you know give someone a meal they might go into your kitchen and, and the the deeper they go into the home right there and the more intimate spaces um, are generally more intimate and sacred relationships right with greater trust required greater intimacy required um, and so forth and to your bedroom is like the most sacred of space right um, and and on your bed right people your kids and your husband or your wife you know depending only hang out on those spaces right there's those are very intimate relationships and, and relational space so they're more sacred space right so in that sense what I'm saying you want to intensify your boundary and your sacred spaces your personal space is you know certain people shouldn't come so close in your personal space. Rape is the ultimate violation of personal space and private space and the body, right? That's sacred. That is a sacred act and it's sacred space that's been violated, right? So when we're talking about uh, intensifying your boundary and using that and making that sacred space, that's what I'm talking about in those kind of terms. It's let that energy kind of give you strength to kind of um, strengthen yourself and you're, you're moving and making decisions from a position of strength rather than having no boundary and just feeling like a victim and just like I, I'm not protected. That, that's kind of where I'm going with this. Otherwise it could kind of sound a little hokey or, you know, like what is this emotional language, especially for those of us that are not generally very emotional naturally or these are kind of harder concepts or we might people might roll their eyes when you say kind of these emotive words right uh, so then focus on the message shame has brought to the situation so now that you've welcomed the emotion you've taken a moment to stop quickly and pause ground yourself in the moment don't dissociate you're focused on okay what's going on and you know what did I miss if you miss something you might have to ask uh, if you're not sure if you've um, uh, said something wrong or whatever and you're kind of just reading people's body language and you're like uh oh I think I might have said something wrong then ask uh, a lot of us that are are not good with our external sensing for those INTJs uh, we will not always care about so much and not or, or recognize sometimes we're just we just miss it like social cues so sometimes we go outside the social boundaries of certain situations without realizing it and we might offend somebody we don't even realize it so ask just say I'm sorry did I offend you did I say something wrong and then they can at least give you feedback and then if you feel shamed like oh I offended you even if you didn't mean to you can quickly direct that you can reconcile the situation you can ask uh, for forgiveness and then boom you're back in a position of honor they're in a position of honor you've the the emotion will move the shame will move away and now you've actually strengthened the relationship and uh, you're you're back on track contentment comes back after you've intensified that boundary as I said you focus on the message that shame has brought to the situation so the message then even in that case we were talking the example of asking if you're not sure if you've offended someone or or done something in that case ask who has been hurt or dishonored so that's the first question the second question that you could ask is what needs to be made right so when shame comes on your first question you're asking yourself who has been hurt or dishonored and what needs to be uh, done or made right what do we have to do to make this right okay and if there's none of those things then you might have weaponized shame going on right um, if you've not done anything to hurt anyone and you're not actually violating God's law you're not dishonoring anyone but someone is trying to make you feel that you are um, and trying to control you then now you're starting to get a sense of the distinction 
Now take, uh, next you're gonna take any preemptive correction necessary to restore integrity, as we said. So what, you know, if somebody's been hurt, if you've, hurt, if you've said something offensive, if you've um, gossiped and then you pulled yourself back, and you're like, I'm sorry, I need to ask forgiveness. I should have gone to that person directly. I shouldn't be talking about them behind their back, uh, that kind of thing. Um, you wanna correct those mistakes. So stop speaking, apologize or make amends quickly. Um, as appropriate. If you're unsure, as I said, ask. Uh, it's better to ask. Own it. Make sure that if it is something you've actually legitimately done, own it. Um, even if it's unintentional, because if you can't own your own shame, then people can't trust you. Uh, they can't trust you that you'll ever stop being abusive because if you have no connection with your shame and you just keep mistreating people and you don't ever connect with that, that you're mistreating people, you've disconnected, you probably have an, all kinds of other boundary issues. You probably have an anger boundary issue that's down. You may have a fear, fear might be trying to come up and, and be a boundary where it's not supposed to be, anger is supposed to be, and then, you know, the shame is also trying to be a boundary by itself, but it needs, ang you know, so it, all of these will work together and so you really have to get healthy in those areas and then you'll be able to handle these situations better. Shame will go away quickly when we catch our missteps quickly. So uh, we want to acknowledge any wrongdoing, as I said, seek to restore the honor um, to, to others so that your honor also then is restored and then that shame wave can go very quickly. Now, what about trauma? What if somebody has trauma? Well, there's toxic shame can overwhelm someone. Recognize the fact that a lot of people have been so traumatized these days from a variety of things that they disconnect from their trauma. That's why we end up getting sociopaths. That's the extreme version of it where they just don't even connect to shame at all. They act shameless, right? They act without shame. They have no internal guard to stop their behavior. They just go with whatever they want and they don't care who they hurt. They don't care who they dishonor, whether themselves or others. And so we have to get that uh, healthy um, connection back. Now, being distracted, being boundary impaired, or dissociating, those are all signs of different things of ex that we do when we have obstructions, when we are disconnected from healthy, free-flowing shame. We want to engage with healthy shame face, to be able to face any memories. You're gonna to have to have that and or your current behavior. So let's say, um, cause it might be tripping you up and causing more shame and then you just get in shame cycles, right? So, um, because trauma is very debilitating, obviously. Um, many people who've had trauma will not be able to handle the emotion of shame. Usually they have the anger boundary down and fear is like just in panic mode and they're just trying to push everything back with fear and outbursts of anger, which is further degrading their boundary. And then they uh, can't take that extra wave of shame because now the internal shame comes up because they're acting so horrible toward everyone and they can't, con they feel out of control. And then their shame is just too overwhelming. So they have to say, it's that person's fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's not my fault. It's always somebody else's fault, so they can't own it. And shame is helping you own it so that you can recognize your guilt, but also then repent and turn from that and restore honor, and honor gets restored. Um, so losing that connection uh, can be very difficult for people that have experienced trauma. So when you've had trauma, recognize that in yourself, and when you are constantly saying it was somebody else's fault, it was always somebody else's fault, and you, if you keep having shame and it's always someone else's fault and you can't connect to own it, you really gotta sit, step back and, and start to analyze your, your behavior and the behavior patterns and the shame cycling that's going on in order to um, come to a place where you can start to distinguish, have I really done something wrong? And, and where am I going wrong? And then how to kind of connect with that healthy shame again. Now, authentic shame is gonna be sensible. It's gonna be momentary. It's gonna be empowering, okay? So the hand goes out to grab the cookie and the internal shame says, 
no, you need to avoid sugar and you need to, your health is more important and your mind starts, you know, telling you, then convicting you and you pull it back and you go, you know what, I'm going to make the healthy choice instead to grab an apple or something like that instead of the cookie, even though the flesh wants the cookie, but uh, the shame comes up to say, no, you know what, I'd rather be healthy and so you can make another decision. Now, if you're in a shame cycle, your hand's gonna go out and you're gonna eat the whole bag of cookies and you're not even gonna be hungry and you're gonna say, oh, I just couldn't control myself. I, I you know, I, I just can't, you know, I just can't, I, I can't control it. And so what are, you, what are we doing? We're being victims then. We're not connecting with healthy shame and we're not able to make a decision. So when you can own the fact that, you know what, I'm gonna eat that cookie and I'm going to treat myself and I'm gonna do it you know, on a healthy, balanced way. I'm gonna have just one cookie and I'm gonna treat myself and I'm gonna do it out of a conscious decision. Um, that's a very different situation, right, than eating the whole bag and then internal shame cycle starts. Oh, you're so out of control and you just can't do anything and now you're just this victim, right? This victim of everything uh, that you're putting in your mouth or your body and, and you're just, you feel out of control, right? And so we have to start with owning it. I'm going to make that decision because if I can own making that decision, like I ate that whole bag of cookies because I chose to. That's the first step of then saying, okay, I can make another decision. So when you're grounded in your healthy boundary and you're saying, and you're owning it and you're making the decision, you know what, I made that decision, I chose to do that. But you know what, I can choose to do something else. <laughs> I can choose to only have one cookie or I can choose to have the apple, right? So we can make other choices. Now, temptation type shame, the enemy uses shame as a weapon through temptation. So temptation is different than testing. Go to James 1 and following for like kind of the distinction. Uh, God does not tempt us. Satan tempts us and he uses shame as a weapon to do so. So he's going to... Uh, you know, get try to pull you into those shame cycles and get you bound in that, right? But that's where recognizing the distinction if it's if it's if it's cycling and if it's not leading you to um, a corrective behavior, if it's not helping guide you toward restoration in a behavior and honor, if it's just you know leading you into um, uh, kind of mindlessly eating the whole bag of cookies and then feeling more and more shame and just feeling out of control. Okay, that's that's gone into weapon, per, weaponized against yourself. Uh, maybe the enemy keeps tempting you, you know, and giving you in situations or whatever, but it can be a combination either or. Um, or we can have someone shaming you, f f fat shaming, right? So, oh, you're such a horrible person. They make it about who you, as if you are horrible because you did something instead of, no, I, I made a poor choice and uh, ate the whole bag of cookies, but that I am not, I am not a, I am not bad myself. That is not your identity. Your identity is in the Lord. And so like making kind of some of those distinctions are going to also be important. Um, not, not feeling like, oh, I made a mistake. Therefore I am bad. You know, like, no, I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And I am going to own my decision and and there was a consequence okay i put on a few extra pounds but now i'm going to make another conscious decision to do something else about it because i am i am not a you know whatever person bad person but um i am the righteousness of god in jesus christ and you gotta you gotta get out of that shame cycle right and so we um let god take that burden of feeling of being uh, that shame that comes with the guilt of eating the cookies, or the bag of cookies, right? Or whatever it is. I'm just using this example, uh, but uh, whatever that issue is that we're dealing with and let him take on, you know, he bore our sin and shame, our guilt and shame, right? He bore that. And so we can let him bear that and we can uh, put on his righteousness and say, I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ and let that empower us and strengthen our boundary and let us make more conscious decisions to choose something else. Uh, and you know, once you start connecting with the Holy Spirit and you, and you get that, it'll, you, you'll be easier to hold back your hand then and make the conscious choice, um, to do so. All right. So 
Let me see if I missed anything. Um, I'm gonna wrap up here. There's a lot that could be said about guilt and shame. But at the end of the day, remember the intense shame appears not to punish you, but to strengthen your inner boundary, okay? It's to strengthen that inner guard. So you got the anger on the outside, you got the fear flowing and connecting with your instincts and intuition, and that, that connection with the healthy anger and healthy fear, which are partners, along with now the internal guard of shame that helps you act honorably, have self-control, and give honor to others by your behavior through that. Now, when all that's flowing together, that now we're getting somewhere, right? Now, you can welcome the wave of shame because it's there to be your personal guard and you don't have to fear it anymore. You can embrace its message. You can ask the questions. If you remember, what were they again? Let me go to my questions. Let's see, we have them. Uh, the key questions, who's been hurt? Who has been dishonored? Okay, who was hurt or dishonored? And what must be made right? So ask the questions. So embracing the message is asking the questions and and whatever that is based on the circumstance, you're gonna deal with it humbling yourself then, even if you didn't mean to, own it. Learning to own your choices and not be a victim. We're not victims. We are conquerors through the Lord, right? So don't be a victim. Own your mistakes, own your decisions. Be strong and, and, and own up to what you're doing and that's gonna help you honor that message, humble yourself even if you made a mistake, even if you hurt someone unintentionally. So I hope this lesson has been helpful. There's a whole lot more we could get into in this topic, uh, but that's all the time we have for today. So we will see you next week. Go to prolongyourdays.com for, uh, for more information and books and resources. Hope to see you next week. Thanks and have a blessed day. Did you know the only thing harder than taming your appetite? It's taming your tongue. In No Man Can Tame, Dr. Anderson reveals the many hidden ways people fall into the trap of giving or receiving an evil report, contaminating not only themselves, but their families, friends, and even entire communities. In this step-by-step -step practical guide to guard your tongue, Dr. Anderson will give you the tools you need to identify and avoid giving or receiving an evil report so that you can cultivate a culture of honor and humility every time you speak. For more information, go to prolongyourdays.com.